I'm fond of saying that I'm excited about nuclear because I think nuclear waste is awesome, and despite the political controversy around it, it is actually the easiest waste to deal with on a per kilowatt hour basis. Of all of the technologies that we have available to us, nuclear energy has by far the tiniest footprint of all. We don't just need to decarbonize electricity, but we need to decarbonize transport and industry, and there's a lot of hard to electrify sources of emissions there, and nuclear is one of the best options that you know, variable renewables and even hydro just can't do. I live in Ontario, so I love using Ontario as an example. It can decrease smog and get off of coal completely. Ontario is the only jurisdiction to ever completely get rid of coal off their grid. The first in North America. Who? Yeah. You run energy for humanity, is my, my understanding. When I started EFH, there were very, very few civil society based organizations advocating for nuclear energy from a humanitarian and environmental perspective. And now there's m many more of them. In fact, today I'm standing in for um, Eric Mayer, who runs Generation Atomic, which is another like, incredibly wonderful NGO that's out there making the case for nuclear energy. I do obviously support all low carbon technologies, but the discourse tends to focus a lot on wind and solar and energy efficiency. And nuclear is really neglected right now in the discussion. If we think about what solving climate change actually means, you can boil it down to a simple two-step strategy, right? First of all, clean up electricity generation, and then secondly, electrify as much as you can, as efficiently as possible. And then yes, we're going to need other technologies to decarbonize those other sectors like heat and transport and liquid fuels, for which nuclear can also play a really important role. So if we, if we talk about the electricity generating system, first of all, we actually have real-world examples where we've already brought the carbon intensity of the electricity generating system in modern industrialized economies down to those levels that are needed, around about 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. France, any others? Sweden. Yeah, Finland is on its way, and actually the UK is too. Switzerland, Brazil, France and Sweden and Ontario have all got rid of fossil fuels from their electricity generating system and continue to be obviously prosperous societies with low, low household bills, uh, very clean air and good GDP, right? So that's what success looks like when it comes to solving climate change. And that's why one of the reasons why I support nuclear as a, making an incredibly important contribution towards meeting our climate and energy security targets. And when you add in the potential for producing clean synthetic fuels using high temperature heat from nuclear technology that could be exported to developing countries that don't yet have the regulatory capability or the supply chain capability or even a grid to actually build out the energy infrastructure, but they could start using those clean synthetic fuels today then I think we're really talking about some progress. If nuclear was successful, is this the end of the oil and gas industry as many people in Alberta are shaking in their boots? Not really, but maybe they should. Take it. No, if anything, I think nuclear offers a pathway to sustainability in a zero carbon economy worldwide. We have to recognize that only 10% of emissions in Canada come from electricity generation. 27% come from oil and gas, not from the combustion, of oil and gas, but the extraction and processing. So that process needs to be decarbonized and nuclear can play a crucial role there as well. So in Canada, one of the priorities needs to be the decarbonization of that extraction processing. Direct air capture, drawing down uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere with the clean, cheap production of hydrogen. Then we have synthetic hydrocarbons that can be plonked into any internal combustion engine without the cost of retrofits or even uh, changing entirely the, uh, the, the system. There's a whole range of really difficult to electrify parts of our economy, um, aviation and shipping, um, in particular, those synthetic hydrocarbons, if we can get them uh, cheap enough, nuclear is a very promising opportunity in that pathway, then that radically reduces the cost of decarbonization. And the people who have the knowledge about the pipelines, but not just in terms of the companies, but the workers there as well. In Canada, a lot of um, oil and gas workers are enormously scared, and rightfully so, about the transition. The answer that the, uh, a lot of environmental justice groups talk about is a just transition, retraining. Well, maybe some of that does need to happen. but. Workers often just don't trust uh, that, that those monies will be there. And also, maybe you're 55 years old. Do you really, you know, is that, is that going to be a, a viable pathway? But if you can continue to be a pipe fitter or whatever it happens to be in a synthetic hydrocarbon economy, then you're fine. You're good. And we have a zero carbon world.
Nuclear is an awful lot more than just power. Representing Canadian nuclear labs, we have Bonita. A lot of people don't know this, but nuclear reactors actually produce medical isotopes, cancer treatments, treatments for heart diseases. At the lab, when we were operating our test reactor, uh, NRU, we produce, we were responsible for over a billion medical procedures. I'd like to hear what your suggestion is. How do we address and respond to the negative connotations people may have about the nuclear industry. Why is it that everybody thinks that the safest form of electricity generation is the most dangerous? Because that's currently where we're at, right? It's the safest form of electricity generation by almost any metric, taking into account all of those accidents that we know about, Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island, and we, you know, and yet here we are with the situation that everybody thinks it's the most dangerous way of making electricity, when in fact 10,000 people die every single day from air pollution caused by fossil fuels. Humans are terrible at making assessments of risk. Like our cognitive psychology, you know, the way that we've evolved, we're really terrible at making rational assessments of risk. And I'll give you an example, which is that we're much more frightened of airplane crash, of dying in an airplane crash than dying in a car crash, but we're much more likely, of course, to die in a, in a car crash and indeed, you know, taking risks like smoking and so on. And there's all kinds of literature around risk assessments. And, you know, it just, and then I'll give you the second reason why we think that it's the most dangerous form of electricity generation, which is that the industry has spent years telling us how dangerous it is by constantly reassuring us about its safety, <laughs> okay? Now, just imagine, going back to the airline analogy, if the airline industry marketed itself on its safety, right? Instead of marketing itself on the kind of aspirational service that it's providing, taking us to destinations, reuniting us with family members, taking us on holiday to incredible conferences like this. You know, that's what we're paying for and buying into when we, when we, when we purchase an airplane ticket. But actually what the nuclear industry has done is, is constantly focused on, and I see it time and time again, the industry itself is beating itself up about Fukushima, for example. And when, so I haven't always been pro-nuclear. As an environmentalist, I was by default anti-nuclear. And I've been on this journey to kind of look again at this technology in light of the scale and urgency of climate change and how difficult it would be for us to solve that challenge just with renewables. And what I found was that almost everything I thought I knew about nuclear was basically wrong. And it's also because, you know, actually there hasn't been civil society-based advocacy for nuclear energy in the past, and now there is more and more, which is wonderful, and actually more and more what we're finding is the United Nations and the International Energy Agency and the Clean Energy Ministerial and lots of other entities are, in light of the scale and urgency of climate change, asking the question, can we continue to power civilization without destroying it? We're looking again at nuclear, and the more people look at it, the more they find that a lot of the myths that persist are just not based in any evidence. And so I would encourage all of you to go and read the World Health Organization and the United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation reports, the most authoritative, credible, expert, perspective that you can find on any of those concerns that you have, whether it's about the public health impacts of Chernobyl, the public health impacts of Fukushima, and come to your own conclusions. Because climate change is the biggest risk that we face today as a species. And if we're serious about solving it, then we have to get serious about evidence-based decision-making. And that means less about our emotional knee-jerk fears and reactions, and more about being clear-eyed and evidence-based in our analysis. As an example, there was, a, there was an article in a medical journal about changing the name of a medical procedure from NMR to MRI. People were so scared of the word nuclear, they were unwilling to go in and get this medical procedure just because of the word nuclear. So, the fear is real, 
the danger is not, which I, th I think you've spoken to quite nicely. Is, is there anything you want to add to I, that? I, I would say that I think we need to be strategic about it. There needs to be um, sections of the population that are very high level of moral worthiness, let's say. Um, so I think that uh, the more environmental organizations that are able to, that are, you know, broadly supported on the, say, green left, the liberal left side of the political spectrum, which is where we primarily find opposition. And I, I say that as somebody who comes from that side. We're increasingly seeing um, uh, environmental groups recognizing on the basis of the evidence that a uh, nuclear actually needs to be part of the decarbonization solution. Um, I think we need to uh, welcome into the conversation uh, the trade unions. I think even though the sort of activist uh, folks get a lot of media attention and have very loud voices, they don't actually represent a, a very large proportion of the voting base. And if you look at, for example, the Power Workers Union in Ontario, um, they have done some wonderful work um, explaining about the necessity of nuclear in Ontario, how it's helped with, our, uh, with the decarbonization process there. And they have a a sort, of, a sort of moral. Um, let's. We have to be honest here that if we're just expecting um, uh, sort of the nuclear industry to be making these arguments, the argument from the green left will always be, well, of course that's what you're going to say. You're out to make a, a profit. What we have to have is we have to have some civil society actors alongside that saying, actually, you know, we have no profit motive to say that nuclear is safe, so maybe you can... Scientists, again, I mean, one of the things that uh, frustrates me enormously is how we regularly talk about how 97% of scientists uh, recognize the reality of anthropogenic global warming. The consensus within the energy systems community about the, that there needs at least to be some role for nuclear, that consensus is almost as, 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 as strong. The question, the re debate really is over how much of a role for nuclear, rather than whether, that, that evidence-based um, argumentation made by scientists, I think, and, and engineers uh, will play a, a big role. And I'd also like to uh, make a you know, big shout out to uh, First Nations in northern Saskatchewan, taking uranium out of the ground. It's the single largest industrial employer of First Nations in the country. And First Nations in northern Saskatchewan aren't anti-nuclear. What they're saying is, if anything, they're worried about the, um, the shutdown of uh, nuclear plants in the United States, and that they're might be job losses. So they're calling on the government to say, you know, you need to support this industry. So that's really another group of people have a really strong moral worth in civil society. First Nations, um, scientists, and trade unions to be at the forefront of making the argument for, for nuclear. Talk just briefly about the Chalk River program for bringing in students to get them exposed to, hey, this is what a nuclear scientist actually looks like. If you're not in the industry and you don't have a particular interest in nuclear, you're just going to watch the Chernobyl show, it's unlikely that you're going to take up, to pull out your phone and be like, that's wrong, you know? Like, I'm, that's not true. It's unlikely you're going to do that. So I find that personally, I, I really make an effort to have those conversations and those discussions are so impactful because your inner circle is likely going to be less t intimidated to come to you to, to look for facts um, and ask you silly questions. There are really no silly questions. And it's also very important to start educating the population at a young age. So what the lab does is we will bring in students, high school students, sometimes even younger, and um, ex expose them to the different fields, the possibilities of the nuclear industry. There's so much that goes into the nuclear industry. There's the environmental protection, the science, and then business development and marketing. There's so much that goes into it. I just have three maxims I would like to share with you that I think could really help with sort of nuclear communications. And the first one is showing up, which is hopefully what we're doing today at this conference, um, because the nuclear industry has a terrible track record of just talking to itself. And actually, it's really important that we go out into the kind of larger world and across different sectors. And that's part of what we're doing here, which is wonderful. Um, and then linked to that is coalition building. And an example of this is in the UK, we created the Low Carbon Alliance between the nuclear, renewables, and carbon capture and storage industries, where we made a sort of joint statement that we are the low carbon industries and we don't throw rocks at each other anymore. And actually, it's incredibly powerful to have a renewables advocate standing up saying, we need nuclear in the mix. And then that brings me to the third point, which is the messenger is as important as the message. And I'm like a broken record when it comes to this one because as exactly as Lee was saying, having a broader range of ambassadors of, you know, and it's all about coalition building and, and showing up, so relationship building, showing up and then having other, other people other than, you know, the industry itself and 
government making the case for nuclear, which is really all we've had traditionally, and neither of those groups, frankly, enjoy very high levels of trust. And we know that the most powerful communications effort is always peer-to-peer. And you were so much more likely to believe something if we hear it from a, a person that we trust or an organization that we trust. And that means we need a broad range of spokespeople out there. And one example of this is when we brought three of the world's most eminent climate scientists to the COP21 climate talks in Paris to make the case for nuclear to be included. For the first time, for two decades of climate talks, nuclear had been entirely excluded. And those climate scientists, who are just you know, godfathers of the environmental movement and the climate community, saying that we need nuclear in the mix, cuts through. So on that note, uh, we have a number of people who have some expertise in nuclear in the room. If you could raise your hands. People, no, Frankie, I'm talking about you. And Andre, and yep, Jolie, your, your hand goes up too. Uh, <laughs> so flag one of us down. If you're like, yeah, but I saw the Chernobyl show, and what about the three people who got into the radioactive water in the suicide squad? Uh, so if I can just do that one real quick. It's true. It happened. Two of them are still alive. 30 years later. The third one had a heart attack a few years ago, sadly. This TV show made it sound like these three people nobly sacrificed themselves. And I, I fully acknowledge the courage it took to do that. But I want to be clear about the environmental consequences and the health consequences of that were very distorted in that show. So if you are curious about nuclear, please do pull one of us aside, ask questions. Uh, I also encourage you to go to energyeducation.ca, which is the website my students have built. But Energy for Humanity is also really awesome. And Lee has a great book, and the Canadian Nuclear Labs also has a great website which can answer an awful lot of questions, cnl.ca. What we haven't really talked about are the economics. So I think in Canada, we've got a really bad track record. You look at the refurbishments at Darlington um, and Point the Pro in New Brunswick. Um, not only the high upfront capital costs, but then also on our poor track record of actually managing effective um, turnarounds for these large facilities. Uh, can we talk about what we can do to improve on that and, and sell the econ economics of nuclear as well? If we look at the experience of Europe, the, the country with uh, some of the cheapest, if not the cheapest electricity in Europe, it's France, uh, which has a largely nuclearized grid. Uh, the country with the, uh, you know, some of the highest electri uh, electricity prices. In fact, there are Catholic charities in uh, Germany campaign around the fact that they have some of the highest rates of uh, uh, energy poverty now as a result of the energy vendor there. Their uh, uh, wind and solar focus, nothing wrong with the wind and solar, but to, uh, to, to switch to wind and solar uh, sh uh, begin to shut down uh, coal while also shutting down nuclear. And the way that they've done it um, has been incredibly expensive. So I think on the, uh, on the economics, uh, we're, we're pretty good. The evidence is, is pretty strong there. Ontario is a very specific uh, case there, I would say. We were asked by the UK government um, about a year and a half ago to um, answer the question, why is it that there are nuclear plants being delivered around the world today for half or even a third of the price that we're seeing nuclear being delivered for in US and Europe. Legitimately, a lot of people are asking the question, hang on a minute, can nuclear really make a meaningful contribution towards solving climate change? Because frankly, if you look out the window in the United States and in Europe today, nuclear looks really expensive and really slow. And what we found was that those costs that are being achieved in Korea, Japan, and, um, and China today um, are not being achieved because, you know, we tested assumptions around, oh, are they cutting corners on safety? Or, you know, are there some sort of like country specific reasons why those costs are being achieved so, you know, successfully low and short schedules? And the answer actually is just that they've got really good at it. And actually, you know what? We have been really good at it in the United States and in Europe and in Canada in the past as well. But what it requires is learning, you know? So, so a really major contributor to those costs that we're seeing today in the United States and Europe are first of a kind, first in a generation, first in country costs. And when you, once you've built the first one, the second unit even, never mind the second or subsequent projects, you see a very significant drop in costs from unit one to unit two. And then if you go on and build the next project, you then you start, you, you've stripped out the costs associated with, with licensing, with qualifying the supply chain, with creating some expertise and, and skills within the project leadership. Um, 
you've got your policies in place, you, you take out those first of a kind costs, and then you can start getting into a real learning curve cost reduction as well. So the best thing that we could do is build a fleet, frankly, and then we start to see nuclear projects being delivered that are not only competitive with other low, low carbon forms of technology, but actually even with fossil fuels. And that's what we're already seeing in other parts of the world today. And a lot of that experience is entirely transferable into our contexts here. And specifically with Point Lepro, that was the first of a kind for that kind of refurbishment, mm -hmm. which I believe is one of the reasons why it wind up being so much more expensive than the subsequent refurbishments that you wind up seeing in Ontario. Yeah. Oh, um, for, example, oh. for example, the Bruce site. So if you look at the Bruce site refurbishment, that is a very, very different economic playground than what you were seeing with Point Lepro. But the nuclear industry, as was stated earlier, doesn't do a good job of actually telling its own success stories. I know Ontario, I'm originally from Ontario, so I knew about Bruce and Darlington and all those. How far west, where's the most closest one from here to here? And second thing is, what's happened to our can-do reactors? That's it. You know, there isn't uh, in, in the West, for sure. In fact, I mean, Canada. in Canada, that is, yeah, sorry. Um, in British, I mean, where I'm from, British Columbia, we actually have a law that bans, uh, bans nuclear, yeah. To give a, a more fulsome and, 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 and a vaguely bitter personal uh, slant on this. Uh, there is a nuclear reactor in, uh, in Edmonton. Uh, it's, called a, it's called a slow poke, it's a research reactor. So the answer he was giving was about power reactors. Um, so there was also one in Saskatchewan. Alberta was looking at getting a nuclear reactor, so they decided to hire somebody who was a nuclear expert to come to Alberta and bring his family here with the promise that there would be nuclear and the opportunity to build up a nuclear program at the University of Calgary. I don't think it's happening, <laughs> but, but, <laughs> um, but there are a number of nuclear reactors that are a lot closer than Ontario. Specifically, we have some down in Idaho, and there's uh, one on the Columbia River in, uh, in Richland, where I used to live. Where the can-do go? There are about, what, 22? 22 in Canada can-do reactors. Um, and, yeah, 22, so they're still operating safely, efficiently. We do a lot of the work f for sustaining the fleet in Canada, actually. So all of the reactors that we have in Canada, the 22 that I mentioned, they're all can-do reactors. So for those that don't know what can-do reactors are, they are nuclear technology that was invented in Canada. And there are some around the world as well. India, yeah. Romania, China, 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 South Korea, <laughs> Romania, Argentina. Yeah, they're, they're all over the place. And the UK is interested in the can-do reactor for plutonium disposition. As a matter of fact, a student of mine who is here did a uh, paper recently and presented it last week on how you can take American spent fuel and put it into a can-do reactor and get more electricity out of it. It's called the dupix cycle. Did want to just sort of add one more thing about why not on the West Coast? Um, I mean, yeah, the, the anti-nuclear thing is, is sort of, it's, that's a certain barrier. But really, basically, it comes down to both the good luck and bad luck that we've had in, in Canada in that we've, we, in many provinces, we have a bounty of hydroelectricity, which is the other major um, uh, uh, you know, low carbon uh, this, uh, so, uh, source of electricity is also firm. That's a that's absolutely brilliant thing. Thank God we have that. Norway has that. Sweden has that to a certain extent as well. A couple of other countries that have uh, been able to fairly deeply decarbonize their grids, but it's not scalable. And it's certainly it, you, you in in many places you simply just don't have the geography for that. But nuclear, you can you can put pretty much anywhere. This is another reason that I uh, that I really support nuclear is that it takes up a lot of land to build a new uh, hydroelectric dam. I mean, the, I don't know if, if you've heard about this but in Alberta, but in British Columbia, enormous fights over the building of the new Site C hydroelectric dam. And I'm kind of worried that if we are moving to, uh, towards like a significant build out of uh, solar and wind, which has, have enormous land footprints, and hydro, which has a very significant land footprint as well, Nuclear, it's teeny tiny, like it's so small, it, even including the uranium mining. I worry in Canada, I mean, there's a lot of conversation today, rightfully so, about decolonization and reconciliation with First Nations. I worry that if we do not take into account the land footprint of some of these other clean energy options, um, and don't recognize the, the seriously low land footprint of nuclear, we're potentially setting up a huge battle between decarbonization and decolonization in Canada. And that's a really dangerous uh, situation that we can, be, we can do away with if we opt for um, a, a larger proportion of nuclear. Not to say don't do these things, but 
the nuclear needs to be a significant part of the answer. To, to get back to your question, what happened with can do, it's a bit like uh, what happened to the 1956 Chevy. It's not 1956 anymore. So the can do, there are generations of nuclear reactors, and most of the can do reactors are what are known as second generation reactors. What we are now looking at is there are a number of exciting companies here in Canada and elsewhere, for example, Terrestrial Energy, who is nice enough to, to set this panel up for us, is one of the many exciting nuclear companies that is looking at building the next generation of nuclear reactors. So in much the same way we don't build the same cars we built from the 1950s, not because they're bad cars, they're great cars, and Candu Reactor, Candu 6 is a wonderful, wonderful reactor. It is my favorite of the operating reactors. Uh, the Candu 6 Plus is you know, even better. Um, the Generation 2, the Generation 3 reactors of CANDU are awesome, but as we go forward, what we're seeing is that there is a, a huge push for smaller reactors that, uh, as we heard about in the previous session, wind up being a little more flexible. They, can, they have higher temperature output, so they can do things like make hydrogen. There's uh, talk about using nuclear-free desalination. A number of really, really cool things with the coming generations of reactors, and that's, that's why you're not really seeing new CANDUs getting built. And where are they based? Can do. Uh, can do is a Can do Industries is currently a subsidiary of SNC Lavalin. <laughs> I have opinions about that too, but I think that's beyond the scope of this this conversation. Uh, other questions? Can you talk about fusion technology and where that might fit in? Fusion technology. You want me to take this one? Fusion. Um, I can. Fusion would be an absolutely astounding technology to get to eventually. I have high hopes that someday this difficult problem will be solved. In a world where we have gone to the moon, sequenced the human genome, and built the internet, fusion is still hard. It seems to be about 30 years away, and we've been saying that for close to 50 years. There are some very exciting opportunities happening within that field of research, but I want to be really clear, fusion at the moment is very much the sort of thing that physicists sit down and spend their career trying to incrementally move forward. I think they are very smart people doing excellent work, and I think it's very important, but the timeline of us trying to get that onto the grid is probably, as you said, about 30 years. Please. So I'm obviously not going to contradict the uh, professor of physics over here. Um, but what I would say that what I'm seeing as a sort of lay person who's kind of interested in commercialization strategies for products that can help us solve climate change, for the first time we're seeing startup companies in the fusion space, which is moving it away from just being, a, as you were describing, a kind of science experiment into actually, you know, real world applications that, that needs to meet cost competitive um, and performance criteria. So that's a really important shift, I think, in the mindset. It is. And secondly, I would say that even if we don't see fusion become commercially available until the mid-century, that's still going to be incredibly needed. So if you think about the kind of 30 years that we have now up until 2050 to turn the tanker and really do some serious climate mitigation in terms of transitioning our fossil fuel infrastructure, um, for the second half of this century, what we're going to probably need is negative emissions. We're going to need to start extracting vast amounts of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And for that, we are going to need another energy infrastructure almost on the scale of the global infrastructure that we had, say, in the 1970s, just to give you a sense of like how substantial that energy consumption may actually be. And so something like fusion coming online in mid-century, you know, could be incredibly transformative and valuable. I'm quite bullish. I, like, I think that's, it's, it's great, but my frustration in terms of conversations about marketing is that it shouldn't be fusion or fission. And that I do worry sometimes advocates for fusion say, hey, don't, don't forget about that fission stuff. F fusion's the future because we don't have to worry about the nasty greens and environmental activists worrying about radioactive waste. Well, th there's still triturated water. And what happens if they're, if they're basically putting all their money on um, the fact that environmentalists won't oppose uh, fusion the way that they have uh, opposed fission? I think they're kind of betting the wrong way. What we should be doing is what, uh, what Kirsty said is, all of the above, let's build a coalition of all the different clean energy options and stop throwing rocks at each other. Uh, you guys have spoke specifically to the fears of nuclear power. Can you speak anything to the fears surrounding nuclear waste? If, let's say, uh, me or any one of you guys in the room um, y use nuclear power to generate electricity for our entire lifetime, the waste 
that's produced from that will fit into a pop can. That's how much waste it will generate. So just to give some context there. In France, uh, they reprocess the waste. Uh, most of the waste is just unused fuel. Um, at the end of that process, I, said 96, I think it's 96% that um, is uh, reusable. Um, and at the end of that process, there is still some, you know, some spicy um, waste left over. But it's spicy for, <laughs> spicy for about 300 years, not the hundreds of thousands that um, uh, environmental activists talk about. That's totally, uh, uh, deal, we can deal with that. Two billion years ago, um, in uh, West Africa, there was a completely natural fission of uh, uranium two billion years ago. And that natural, uh, for, because of specificities of the geology of the region, it produced a certain amount of what we today would call uh, nuclear waste. That um, waste has stayed stable, barely moved, in for two billion years. So when, what we're doing when we're looking for deep geological repositories, we're looking for similar sort of locations that are, that are sufficiently stable. We know how to deal with this. In fact, that was, for me, I was, I was like Kirsty. I was, for a long time, I was anti-nuclear, and it was the waste, it was the issue that I was worried about. And um, it was reading about uh, the Finnish um, deep geological repository, where like, oh, yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess we can deal with this. It's, we can do this. Yeah, I, I really want to hear about Jason saying, because he said spent feels awesome, which was quite a funny thing. But I w I'll just say very briefly that, so I was in one of those deep geological facilities a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> At least, I know, so lucky. <laughs> 500 meters down, it took seven minutes to go down in the lift. I was kind of freaked out. There's one getting built in Finland, there's one getting built in Sweden. I mean, actually the one in France is, is, is still at the lab stage. However, right? I really think that it's problematic making this the solution for radioactive waste because there isn't any other waste stream that we vitrify into glass, encase in copper canisters, wrap in concrete, and then bury in a highly engineered facility with a claim attached to it that this will be safe for hundreds of thousands of years and could survive in the next ice age. Because to me, what that is actually communicating is that this is the most dangerous substance known to man, right? We are, we are communicating the idea that this stuff is uniquely, um, terrifyingly dangerous, when actually in, in reality, we store it extremely safely above ground right now in facilities all over the world in countries that have nuclear power, and nuclear waste has never harmed anybody or the environment. End of story. Full stop. You know, he talks about the, the waste stream from, from solar. There's no sort of regulatory regime forcing uh, solar panel manufacturers to be responsible for their end-of-life waste. Um, and perhaps they should, because the, the waste at the end of that includes you know, lead, cadmium. Uh, these are uh, you know, heavy metals that, um, and because the, the toxicity there is elemental, it doesn't change over time, whereas at least with, uh, with radioactive waste, clearly the toxicity declines over time. Um, and what happens there? We see children in third world countries, developing countries, picking out um, useful products out of the waste solar panels. Now, the solar industry will say, well, we can, we can deal with that. I mean, there just needs to be a, a sensible regulatory uh, regime for, for safety. It's like, well, yeah, that, you're right. Absolutely. We can totally fix that. And that's what we do with, uh, with nuclear as well. So, I mean, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. One of the interesting things about nuclear waste is that you have to pay for the nuclear waste's disposal before you make it. So the ratepayer has been paying for nuclear waste since the first electricity went on the grid. So they set aside 16 bubba billion dollars, bubba billion dollars, and they have actually built the bubba billion dollars. They have built the waste repository plans around the budget. What happens if you give an engineer too much money to build something. <laughs> they get excited. No, and it's, it's actually kind of fun to watch. So Canada has taken the opposite approach of the US, where the US was like, we're going to put it in Yucca Mountain. We said so. Canada was like, does anybody want nuclear waste buried in their backyard? 23 communities went, yo. And the NWMO went, uh, stop. We can't handle more than 23 volunteer communities trying, trying to come forward. We only need one. Of those 23 communities, 18 have been eliminated. We are now down to five communities. I've been to all five communities. And what they do is they pull me aside and say, hey, Jason, psst, like, seriously, how do we win this? 
We want nuclear waste buried in our backyard. How do we get this? We want to win. Every single community that's still in the, in the game is actively fighting to get this. They want it and they are pissed that there is only one repository. It's sort of like the Highlander. There could be only one. And it's, it's frustrating because these are depressed regi regions where they can wind up getting a perfectly safe industry into the ground that will guarantee them jobs for the next couple hundred years. What's even better is that the nuclear waste, while we are putting it into this overly engineered canister, part of the engineering is making sure we can get it back out again if we want to. There is one t -t 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 trillion dollars worth of material in that nuclear waste. There is literally gold in there that we do not yet have the, the capability to pull out. So when I say that nuclear waste is amazing, nuclear waste is awesome, nuclear waste is a trillion dollar industry in Canada waiting to happen, that's what I'm talking about. I promised that we would hang out and answer questions. There is another panel starting, so we might actually move outside for that. Thank you very much for your attention. And let's thank our speakers.